All righty, welcome to Unsafe Spaces. I'm Randy Cross. We've got our typical jam-packed uh, about a half hour or so for you. Um, we'll have our ambulance. We'll have our feel-good stories. Uh, this week's interview is, is, again, I will say, is pretty special. Because if you know any kids that play youth sports, and when I say youth sports, I mean like five to through high school, um, if, if you're a grandparent, if you're a parent, um, you need to hear about Team Safe Sports and TeamSafeSports.com. It's something that's grossly underserved. Um, it's something that those of us that are around sports kind of assume at times that this is being done. And honestly, most of the time, it isn't. So uh, let's catch up a little bit and learn something about what Team Safe Sports is. Go, go. Oh, oh my gosh. gosh. Every coach, every organization, every league, every facility should have that kind of information at their fingertips. Well, hi there. As promised, we're going to talk now to Dr. Stephen Horowitz with TeamSafeSports.com. Um, and, and we do news, we do, do information, we do sports, but a lot of this information is, is, is the kind of stuff that people, if you have a child involved in any level of sports, if you have a grandchild, if you have a neighbor, a kid you care about, um, you have got to have this information. And not only do you have to have this information, the leagues and the coaches and the facilities, everyone needs this type of follow-up and this type of information. So, you know, with that set up, Dr. Horowitz, welcome. Thank you for uh, joining us on, on uh, Unsafe Spaces. Thank you so much, Randy. It's, it's a privilege to be here. Thank you. And, and, and your, your app, um, and obviously it is entailed as it is, but looking through the website, looking through the information, um, it, it's something that when I first talked to you and first started looking into this, I was stunned that this A, hadn't been done before, B, wasn't just the accepted rule as to, to how you did this, especially in today's te technologically based environment where everybody's got a phone, everybody's got apps on their phones. Um, how did you come up with this idea? My, just kind of my personal history of being involved with youth sports, just from being on the sidelines with kids all the way up to the Olympic Games, um, educating coaches, teaching CPR for over 30 years, being a coach, being a board member of a league, you know, still dabbling uh, as, a, as a wannabe athlete, you know, even now, 
Um, so I get competition. I completely get competition. I completely get that, you know, athletes are not going to say anything. Um, but what I realized was at the youth sport level, and when I say youth sports, I mean five to 14 year olds, there's just nothing. And when I was out on the sidelines, I just saw the, the utter lack of preparedness because frequently at youth events, and I'm not talking about more typical youth events, like a, like a football game where there's likely going to be somebody, you know, even at the youth level, at the game, there might be an EMT, there might be an athletic trainer, but what about soccer and field hockey and volleyball? Mm -hmm. Um, Oh my gosh, there's yeah. really nothing. So well, when you, I saw you, there was nothing, I said I had to do something about you, it. You bring up a great point because we all say youth, youth level of sports. And d define what youth really is by definition. Yeah, you know, in, in, at least in the sports medicine literature, um, that definition of youth really applies to high school because there's something out of the University of Colorado called Reporting Injuries Online, which is a database that athletic trainers can report injuries into. But there's nothing for youth, and youth is younger than high school, right? Elementary school, middle school, from when your kids play, start to play sports up through that middle school level. So they hit 13, 14, you know, 14 years old, then they're in high school, then there's some semblance of, at least on paper, some type of organization. Uh, and I do say on paper, uh, maybe even say that somewhat yeah. sarcastically and sadly, because uh, it frequently is just on paper. Yeah, because I, I mean, I can't tell you how often in a bag, and I, and I was thinking back to when my youngest it, it was a son, and he was involved in baseball and football and basketball and whatnot, and coaches have a folder on kids, but that's what it is, a folder. So, you know, it's it just something that to me was, was startling that how to compile that information is something that you guys offer coaches and leagues and whatnot. But also, more importantly, like you just said, if youth is high school, good God, what is the gap below that 14 to, let's say, 8? How many kids are involved in that level of sport where – you know, for I, I I don't mean this the wrong way, but in that context, it's kind of the wild, wild west because there's not much in the way of of help or resources out there for people, is there? Yeah, I mean, the statistics are 20, 40, 60 million kids in youth sports all the way up to 18 and about 8 million ish play high school. So that leaves 10, 20 plus million kids in the youth area and that binder that you mentioned, at least from what I've seen, that's truly a best case scenario because I rarely see a binder. And then is that binder up to date? And, and maybe that's a kind of a good segue into a, you know, maybe the first issue in youth sports safety is how come the high school kids need to take a sports physical, but the youth kids don't? So when you have that binder on the youth kids and your organization doesn't require a physical, how accurate is the information in the binder? Right. Right. It's hey, a little I, scary. Now, how, how difficult is there? You know, if I'm a if I'm a coach or I'm a league right now, I'm hearing this. How difficult is it for them to a compile the information you need and, or, or b even download it and get it to the app where it can be? you know, put out by player and everything else and it needs to be done. Well, the way they do it now, typically, I mean, I just spoke to some organizers of youth football. I, I don't want to say where, and, right. and they say they have a binder and they feel comfortable that it's up to date because at least with their organizations, they require the sports physicals, but he kind of shook his head and said, but it's still all on paper and it's a real hassle to get that. So in our team safe sports system, the parent just enters, uh, answers questions and can snap pictures of the sports physical. Um, hopefully everybody's using the American Academy of Pediatric Sports Physical form, which is only three pages, snap the three pictures and it's in the database. One, mm -hmm. two, three. And then you have your whole roster on your phone and you can see which kids have what issues. You know, do you know it's hot now? Do you know which kids of yours have sickle cell trait? Right, 
Right. Every, every baby in the United States has been tested for at least the last decade. So if a parent, you know, a parent would know that information. We yeah. certainly should know because their baby was tested. So um, if if you don't know that information, we have some major problems. If you're in Texas or Florida or Georgia or Arizona, right. and you're playing in the heat, and we don't know that that child is more susceptible. It doesn't mean they can't play; just means they're more susceptible and needs a longer, slower, um, you know, acclimatization process. Well, even down to you know food allergies and. Um, Bingo. insect allergies and you know who who would require an EpiPen and how many EpiPens are being carried and all those kind of type of things right oh my gosh you know my neighbor has a volleyball program and it's 80 girls and I asked him do your kids have any medical conditions and he said no but then I continue to ask him hey how about that thing you stick in the thigh called an EpiPen he goes oh my gosh I have two kids that need it so he said, my kids don't have any medical conditions, yet two of them have life-threatening medical conditions. And then we went on to the discussion of where's the EpiPen? Well, the parents come to all the tournaments because volleyball is tournament. Right. I said, well, you just have a brand new practice facility. Oh, the parents just dropped them off. And then as soon as he said that, he froze and he said, oh, my gosh, the parents drop them off and they have the EpiPen. So when they're with me for the next 90 minutes to two hours, I don't have the EpiPen. Mm-hmm. Ouch. Yeah. Ouch. You know, what can, what, as a parent, what can I do right now? I hear this. I hear about your message. I'm just learning about your app. What are the proper steps? What, what do I do? I mean, is it as simple as talking to the coach, talk to the league? I think in today's world, you know, you need to politely demand. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it's the safety of your child. I'm not one of these, let's stop all youth sports kind of people. I had my fondest memories in youth sports. I love youth sports, but there's no reason to not have safety and they're not mutually exclusive. So it's just as simple as telling your league, you know, and asking your league. I've asked parents, you know, do you know, do you even know? I asked softball leagues, right? Local to where I am in Texas. Do you know if the coaches know CPR? And I just got deer in the headlights. Mm -hmm. I, I like, mom, dad, are you kidding? It's softball. There's something called commotio cordis where the ball can hit your chest at exactly the wrong time and interrupt the electrical signal to the heart. And without an AED and it's happened, your child's dead. And it's happened and yeah. it doesn't have to happen. And I just get deer in the headlights and, you know, our attitude of, you know, it won't happen to me is way too prevalent until it does. And now you have, you know, heat organizations, poor parents where their kids died of heat, they have the kid's name on it. And sudden cardiac arrest, and they have the kid's name on it. And head injuries and concussions, and they have the kid's name on it. And blunt trauma, and they have the kid's name on it. And I can go on and on. Right. Instead of having a preparedness system. And, and like you say, this preparedness system... And at all levels, it should include some sort of trained individual on site. I mean, ideally, and it's not going to happen, but, you know, it's an EMT type. Um, but, you know, all leagues can't afford that kind of coverage. But the coaches and the people involved should not only have some sort of training, they should have this kind of information at their fingertips. Yeah, I mean, parents, all parents should advocate for athletic trainers, um, paramedics, uh, somebody like that on the sidelines. But like you say, that's unfortunately not reality. And even if we have that, we still need some type of system so there can be proper communication and documentation because those are the two words, if you talk to any attorney, that always come up are lack of communication and documentation. But in the world of youth sports, we just want to cover those first five, 10, hopefully not longer than 20 or 30 minutes until the ambulance comes. So it's those decisions that are made in those first few minutes that can make or break the outcome. And if we have the kids' data right in front, I've shown uh, our Team Safe Sports uh, app to you know EMTs and trainers and like, oh my God, this would be so great to have all the kids' information, what medication are, are they on, et cetera right in front of me, like right there, right when I arrive. 
And then the decision-making processes of, you know, the kid may or may not have had a concussion. They see the doctor with the parent. Well, where's the doctor's note? Oh, I can't tell you how many where the doctor's note stories there are. Where's the doctor's note? What does the date on the note even mean? Because in like in the high school world and up, um, that means you're going to start the quote return to play protocol. And in the high school, college and professional world, there's a definition for that. But in the youth sports world, nobody knows what the return to play protocol is. So what does the date on the note mean? And I hope the note's not written on a little prescription pad, which is very common in youth sports. So, and then parents are competitive. So they'll go to the emerging med down the street and get the provider to, you know, twist the arm and sign the note. And where's the oversight of that? So can the administrator of the organization see the note from his or her phone and say, well, this doesn't really look like it might be valid. Maybe I need to call mom and dad about it and and verify. You know, it, it would be something that you would have, obviously, in this app itself, but on, along another line of something you're very familiar with, um, the whole idea of head traumas and concussions, uh, which would be in this medical records if there's been some, some history of that. In, in youth sports specifically, and we'll go with my version of youth, which is the 8 to 14, the unserved window we're discussing, um, how, yeah. how prevalent? Are our concussions? How prevalent are head injuries? Well, the scary thing is, you know, we we see statistics of, you know, a million and a half to three million, and that does go up through seventeen, eighteen. But then the studies, the most recent studies, are quick to remind us that we really don't know because, like I had mentioned, we have somewhat of a repository of a database for high school, but we have zip. For youth, that 5 to 14 underserved population, we don't have any data collection system. And that's one of the reasons I'm so excited about Team Safe Sports and some of the studies we're about to start. You know, we want to capture that information. So we want to know, well, how many really, how many really are we having? What is the true incidence of youth sports concussion? What is really going on? Because we don't know. Yeah. We just don't know. Wow. And those underserved kids are not... They're not getting the right follow-up. I can't tell you how many parents have come to me and said, you know, does, does Johnny really need to go to the doctor because my deductible is $5,000 or right. I don't have insurance? You know, where's the guidance for these people? Again, in schools and whatnot, trainers, medical staff, there's some guidance, again, at least on paper, but in the youth world, where's the guidance? Nothing. And I hear, oh, the story's really, really bad a very poor follow-up, very poor handling of, of these injuries. And the kids still suffer. Wow. That's incredible. Months and years later. And they're, and they're kids, really kids. We're not talking about professional athletes that played like you. Um, we're just talking about kids. So what, what we really want to do is prevent that second impact from occurring before the first one is truly healed. And they really need a team of, of specialists, you know, you need that good primary care provider who can go do a good intake and then know whether or not they really need to go to somebody like a neuropsychologist and, and get more expert follow-up um, and have that all as part of the team approach to, to handling this. Wow. Just incredible information. Really, really appreciate you joining me. I want to remind people, if you need more information, it's info at team safe app.com if you really want to call it's 800 400 4995 the website is teamsafesports.com dr stephen horowitz thank you so much for joining me appreciate it and uh, just got to wish you the best of luck in trying to help a whole lot of people thank you so much love your podcast keep up the great work thank you all right man thank you Well, thank you again to Dr. Horwitz. Uh, fantastic information about Team Safe Sports and TeamSafeSports.com if, if you want to look it up. Again, that number is 800 400 
4995 to find out how your team, how your league, how your facility can better serve the kids and be ready when those terrible things happen. And unfortunately, they do happen in sports. And if you want more info by email for them to send to you, it's info at teamsafeapp.com. Teamsafeapp.com. All right, let's get along down the road here, and that means time for Unsafe Spaces Sports. All right, this time of the year, August, baseball's winding down. These are the dog days, as we teased about two months ago. When they come, they can kind of drag, and it's dragging right now in baseball for a lot of teams. But one team it's not dragging for are the Boston Red Sox. And in all honesty, unbelievable record. May or may not have basically clinched their division already. And mathematically, no. In reality, probably. Uh, they are, as we always refer to in sports when it happens like this, with their payroll, they're the best team that money can buy. And you know what? They have bought it. It's, uh, it's pretty amazing. Congratulations to them. Quick note here on the Red Sox. Jerry Remy, former infielder for the Red Sox and longtime announcer, um, announced that his uh, cancer has reoccurred. He's beaten it a couple times. I'm sure he's going to beat it again. All right, let's move along to uh, the world of golf. Firestone Country Club hosted, uh, hosted their tournament there, uh, which is part of the World Golf Championship Series, for what probably is going to be the last time. And during the course of that, Justin Thomas, who won the tournament with his new Titleist driver, I believe it's like a TS2 or a TS edition. Um, yeah, you know, everybody hits these big ones. I think he hit it like 390 yards. <laughs> it's ridiculous. And, you know, just consider the fact Justin Thomas is about 5'10", 165 pounds. So lack of size is no excuse. It's just physics. But congratulations to Justin Thomas. And, uh, hey, something's coming to uh, this, uh, this area, the Atlanta area, this weekend. People should be aware of. And when it comes to your town, all I'm telling you, if you like fun, if you like excitement, if you love basketball, and you love a crazy good show, check out the big three. Now, you've heard about the big three here before. We had Amy Trask on, who is their CEO of that organization, a um, lot of people involved in it, familiar names from the world of basketball. Um, Ice Cube, he's, he's, the, he's the man when it comes to uh, what goes on in that league. And it is fun. They've got a four-point shot. And it really is. It is truly three-on-three. Three. So this Friday night, the Infinite Energy Arena, Arena up in Duluth, uh, the big three is coming to town. It'll also be on Fox and FS1 and whatnot, but check it out in person. And it'd be, it'd be worth your while. Bring the kids, because it really is kind of family entertainment uh, from a sports standpoint, because these are highly skilled athletes that can really still do it. And one of the highlights of the sports year every summer it hap- takes place in Canton, Ohio. Now, that's the home of the, of the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And that's where the most exclusive fraternity in sports expands just a little bit every year. And this year's class uh, went in for their induction. Now, there were, there's, I guess, eight of them. Unfortunately, Ter- Terrell Owens decided that he wasn't going to take part in this whole, this whole uh, exercise, so he wouldn't be around. But the other seven were there. The other seven, they were all inducted. Their busts are now in Canton. And as somebody that played football, you really learn to appreciate, A, what a special place that is, and B, what a special group, not only this smaller group is, but the larger group. Because of all the people that have ever played professional football since the early 1920s, there are now right around 300 people that are in the, the, the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Congratulations, to all of them. All right, let's move right along to our next segment, which is 
Wambulance or butt hurt. Uh, that just kills me every time. That's crazy. I love it. Um, this is this is a great story, uh, and and I really, you know, sort of challenge you to tell me this isn't kind of fun. You know, police are called to disturbances all the time, um, and if you know anybody in the law enforcement business, their least favorite one is a domestic dispute. How do you sort of soften things up? How do you kind of, as you roll up, make it a little less confrontational? How about this note from the Jacksonville police, thanks to that great group back in the 70s and 80s, war. Check this out and listen up. No, because I don't want to. I don't want your Facebook. Don't post shit about this shit. I don't post anything. Yeah, that's the cop car playing that. Watch his face when he turns around. Whoa! <laughs> Well played. Sheriff's office down there in Jacksonville. That's a good deal. I mean, uh, hey, we got to say thank you to those people that serve. Um, And I really, really personally appreciate everything they do. And little things like that go a long ways uh, towards maybe not making their job any easier, but maybe a little less confrontational. And, you know, congratulations on that. And along the same lines, we'll keep it in the law enforcement environment, uh, is our feel-good story of the week. By way of explanation, um, when a police officer is on his last call before he retires, there's a whole procedure and tradition of how you put out that last call and, and what they do. Um, and this story will document part of that, but it's a little bit unusual in that uh, in Southbridge, there was this officer going off duty who was retiring. And he has two sons, one of which had already told him, I guess about a week before, that he would not be able to come home uh, for his dad's last call. Hey, stuff happens. Stuff gets in the way. Here's how it went. It is a great pleasure to announce that as of 11, 16 hours on this date, after more than 31 years of service to the town of Southbridge, Officer Dwayne Arledu, badge number 1041, is retiring his, and is giving his final Code 5. It's my honor as the chief of the department to acknowledge this Code 5. Officer Dwayne Aladu, batch 1041, you are officially code 5. At 11, 17 hours. The Salvage Police Department of the Town of Salvage want to thank you for your dedicated service to the law enforcement profession. Wish you the best of luck in your future endeavors. Congrats, brother. 10-4. I thank you. Too much to say, but thank you. And... To everybody in my family, everyone I've served with, and to my boys. Time to go home. Just, it's time to go home. Thank you. Glory to all units. It is my sincere pleasure to announce that as of 11, 17 hours on this day, after 32 and a half years of service, my father, South Virginia Police Officer Dwayne Ledoux, is retiring and has given his final Code 5. It is my honor to acknowledge this Code 5, to set free a man who has sacrificed so much of his time for all of us, so, he, so that he may spend the rest of his life discovering new craft beer, exploring this beautiful country, and most important of all, chasing glory. Officer Ledoux, badge number 1041. Dad, 
you are officially code five. Love you. Is that me or is that Treadway? That's <laughs> me. <laughs> he did come home. He did. <laughs> Do you think he would miss it? <laughs> oh. <sighs> I'm at the rotary. Uh, by the way, I'm at the rotary still. I called that. <laughs> All right, officer, congratulations and uh, to a son that traveled across the country to do that for his dad. Well played. Want to uh, remind you when it comes to social media, where you kind of find us, you obviously have found us here, but uh, all the various places, YouTube, SoundCloud, iTunes, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, you go to randycross.com, unsafespacesusa.com. If you have any suggestions, any kind of input you want to ha- want to make, it's producer at unsafespacesusa.com. All right? That'll do it for this week. And to you, we all here say happy trails. Happy trails to you. Again. Who cares about the clouds when we're together? Just sing a song and think about sunny weather. Happy trails to you. Till we meet. Oh, yeah.